Good morning. It is January 14th and it is blistering cold outside. We are so grateful for you joining us for worship and hope wherever you are that you are warm and that this service today warms your heart as well. Here at Woodlawn, we're committed to maintaining this online service for days just like today when it is blistering cold and the weather elements make it difficult or impossible to get to worship. We're glad that you are here and watching. The second reason we maintain this service is because we offer it as an invitation for those who might be interested in learning a little more about Woodlawn as a community of faith and grace. One of the things that is in Woodlawn's very DNA is our focus on missions and ministry. Did you know each Sunday Woodlawn has a particular moment for mission we designate giving towards? If you're interested in finding out more about Woodlawn or interested in finding out how you can give, you can find all that information on our website, woodlawnumc.net. As we prepare our hearts to receive the words of our Lord today, I invite you to join me in the call to worship. The words are on the screen. The voice of God calls to us. Are you listening? Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. The hands of God beckon us. Are you paying attention? Show us, Lord. Your servants are paying attention. The love of God asks us, are you ready to follow? Guide us, Lord, and we, your servants, will follow. Come, let us worship the God whose tenacious love never stops calling and beckoning and asking us to follow. Thanks be to God. Amen. These words were written by Dr. Lisa Hancock from Discipleship Ministries.
we come together now in a time of prayer. I'll offer up a pastoral prayer, but I invite you to share any prayer requests you might have. If you're watching on Facebook, you can list those in the comments. Know that you can always call the church office and alert the pastors if there's a prayer you'd wish to be added to the prayer chain or for the pastors to be aware of. And if you are a member of the Woodlawn Congregation and you do not receive the prayer chain email and you would like to, um, contact the church office and we will add you to that email list. After I finish my pastoral prayer, I invite you to say the Lord's Prayer with me together. Let us pray. Beckoning God, in the stillness of the night, you called Samuel into your service. And we ask that you call us into service with a voice we are able to hear. Help our hearts and our ears to be tuned in when the call comes through. And God, we confess that, that we often need to clear out the noise and the chaos that keeps us from recognizing your loving voice. Help us to seize those opportunities. God, declutter our hearts and our minds so that you might be the only voice we hear. Loving God, you call us by name to be your people in the world, pouring your love into us in such abundance that it overflows into the world around us. Guide us and form us. Work through us, holy God, that we might be an answer to prayer for others, that others might see a reflection of your love and your light, your compassion and your mercy in our actions or in our words. Let us be vessels of your will. Call us, Lord. We, your servants, will follow. We ask all this as we pray together the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Last week, we had the exciting privilege in in-person worship of welcoming seven confirmands into membership of the church. We remembered Jesus' baptism and remembered or anticipated our own baptisms. We were reminded that Christ breaks into our lives, not just in a manger, not just in a dove that descends during baptism, but today and every day for each one of us in an endless number of ways. We're also reminded about God's claim on us. That's what baptism is all about, right? God's gracious and unrelenting claim on each of us as the people of God. So this week, we take it a step further. What does it look like when we live out that call, being the people of God? After all, we are and are becoming the people of God. As John Wesley might say, we are moving towards perfection. And that brings us to our scripture focus for today, the story of Samuel. Do you remember the story of young Samuel? We'll start at 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. When the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli. He said, Here I am, for you have called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and he lied down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. 
Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am, for you called me. But he said again, I did not call. My son lied down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of God had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And Eli finally perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, go and lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went, laid down in his place, and now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Let's set the stage a little bit at this point in the story of the people of God. They have fled Pharaoh and Egypt. They have been delivered by God. They have wandered in the wilderness learning lessons and now find themselves in the promised land, the land that was promised to Abraham. There have been a, times where, a time where they were ruled by judges, that, that God raised up people and voices of wisdom. And then at the end of the book of Judges, we are told everyone does what is right now in their own eyes no longer listening to these leaders raised up by God. And of course, this is happening over generations and generations. So now there is chaos and, and things are out of control. And we're told it's because there is no king of Israel. All this serves as a reminder for us, though, that even in the promised land, it is not easy or without conflict. With everyone doing what is right in their own eyes, it's no wonder that the religiosity of the community is also suffering. First Samuel 2 speaks of how even the priest Eli's own sons, who were also priests, were corrupt. They did what was right in their own eyes as work as priests. They kept the better part, the best part of the sacrifices people brought to the temple for themselves to eat. So Samuel finds himself in times that feel void of divine engagement, precarious times where the word of the Lord is rare in those days. This is Samuel's reality. And perhaps, you know, the story of Samuel's call maybe is a familiar one for you. Young Samuel lying by, by the ark in, in the temple of the middle of the night, and there is a still, small voice. We know it's the middle of the night because the passage says that the lamp of God had not gone out. And Exodus tells us that this special lamp was lit in the temple during the evening and it stayed lit through the darkness of the night, burning until morning. So we know Samuel heard this voice in the middle of the night, a still small voice, but it woke him instantly. He hurried, thinking it was Eli, his teacher and his mentor. He runs so willingly to see what is needed. And Eli turns him away. It takes several times of Eli turning him away before Eli realizes what is happening and finally steps in to his role, telling Samuel, this is the voice of God speaking to you. He tells him what to expect and what to say. And, and God continues to call again faithfully. You know, there are some other major characters at play here. Well, we obviously have Samuel and Eli, the priest, and of course, God. But a major character, a major part of this story that's not even included in this part of the text is Hannah. That's Samuel's mother. You see, Hannah is one of two wives. And she's unable to conceive a child. This broke her heart and she is deeply grieved. So she went to the temple, the same temple in which Eli resides, you might remember. And she prayed from the depths of her soul. Eli heard. And wrongfully, he accuses her of being drunk because simply she was praying silently, but her lips were moving. A priest without compassion, and another sign of, of misguided times here. But despite this, Eli does tell Hannah that her prayer will be answered. She prays for a child, and she promises to get, dedicate 
that child to God to, to release him to the temple. This family structure, two wives, may seem strange or even immoral to us, but remember, it was culturally common. In the same way, Hannah's promise to God to release her child to the temple may seem extreme or, or rash to us, but one might compare her dedication of her son to the Lord the same way that we view baptism or infant dedication. Hannah establishes her commitment to God to raise her child to know God, and she affirms her knowledge that her child, just as all of us, belong to God. Hannah's vow is similar to the ones that parents make at infant baptism, similar to the ones that congregations make when a person or a child is baptized. Children develop their own relationship with God. It's our responsibility to nurture and to guide the relationship as the child grows. We could say then, more accurately, that the story of Samuel does not start with the call story that we've read and heard today. And it even predates Samuel's birth. The story of Samuel really begins when his mother pledges and dedicates him to God and her prayers. She promised to nurture him and to care for him. And at his birth, she sang a prophetic song of joy, which later is echoed in the same song that Mary sings. Similar song that Mary sings upon learning of her child to be born, Jesus. Samuel's story begins with a prophetic and a prayerful mother who prayed over him, who sang over him, who held him until he was weaned and then could be freed to minister and to learn in the temple. We each have also been known by God. And we have been brought before God, if not through parents or, or families, perhaps it's through friends or, or a pastor or a youth leader. Maybe even a stranger who helped guide us along the way to a place where we could hear God's voice. We could hear God's call where we could encounter our Lord. So I ask you, who have your Hannahs been? Who has nurtured you in your faith? Who led you to a place where you could hear God's call? Who has prayed over and sang over you? We give thanks to God. Another big player in this story of Samuel is the priest, Eli. Eli is an insider by all appearances to the community. He is a priest, but not without struggles. We know that the word of the Lord was rare in those days, which tells us the priest, Eli, was not really doing well at his role. Even though he was an insider in all manner of the human eyes, the outsider, the boy, the young boy being trained in the ministry, that's the one that God chose to speak to. A reminder for us that God speaks to us all and is not limited by our status or our expectation of who God should speak to. God does not always choose the expected ones. Think of Moses or David. Unlikely heroes, just like Jesus, who calls fishermen and laborers to serve as disciples, not the priests of the temple. Even outsiders can and are given tasks in God's kingdom. So here is an outsider, Samuel, the, the one doing the grunt work, the one who is kind of an intern of sorts at the temple, doing the heavy lifting, and yet he's the one who hears the voice of God speaking. Now, as we heard, it took several tries, but Eli finally knows the truth as well. This is the voice of God, and Eli has an opportunity because, you know, maybe Eli could have withheld this knowledge out of jealousy or spite. He could have not shared that the Lord was the one speaking. He could have withheld the instruction of what to do and what to say. Eli could have kept things the same. Where the voice of the Lord is rare in those days. But he knew there was a new beginning 
on the horizon, a new way forward. It reminds me of a quote from, from Samuel Wells, God's people cannot be known for our nostalgia. We must be known for our hope. Eli doesn't cling to the past with fear. No, we see Eli choose wisely. We see Eli step into the mentor and the leader role, and he confirms it is the Lord speaking to you. He introduces Samuel to the source of the voice, and he instructs him how to respond and how to proceed from there. He says, say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. He, he tells him to acknowledge who it is that is speaking to him, the Lord, and he tells him to put himself in the appropriate position, saying, I am your servant. He says, you're telling this voice, I know who you are. I know who I am, and I want to hear what you have to say. I want to follow what you want me to do. I want you to teach me. I want to learn. I'm all ears. I'm tuned in to your words. Samuel makes several stumbles in this story. He even forgets to say, Lord, when he goes back to respond. But he gets, speak, your servant is listening, part right. And we know the rest will follow because we see the servant's heart that is present in Samuel, ready to serve the little boy jumping up in the middle of the night. You know, I, it's no doubt that Eli is advanced in years, his hearing and his sight de depreciating. The story tells us, though, that he still has a role to play in God's story. He's the one who knew what to do when God appeared to Samuel. He knew how to listen and how to speak, and he knew it was his duty. It was his call from God to share this knowledge and to instruct Samuel, to guide him. Eli's role reminds us that we learn how to discern God's voice and call in the context of community, so often by people who have gone before us. Those that help us tune in to what God might be saying, those who mentor us, who help us listen for that voice. So I ask you, who are the Eli's in your life? The teachers, the mentors, the guides, the leaders, the ones who have helped you tune in to where God might be speaking or calling you to go. We give thanks to God. Just as we've reflected on the Hannahs and the Elis of our lives, there comes a time when it's our turn to step into those roles, our turn to be the nurturers or mentors, to turn our turn to gather others to Christ, to help others, young or, or hear the voice of, of God and to know what to do. You know, I think this is one of the most beautiful things about this passage. It points to the intergenerational body of Christ, the beauty of the church. There's a part to play for each of us. For we need our Samuels, we need our Hannahs, we need our Elis, all three. And we might fill those roles and have those roles filled for us at different stages and, and seasons of our lives. And we know that Eli needs Samuel. Samuel is the future. Samuel is helping Eli complete the daily tasks of the temple that Eli cannot do by himself at his age. But Samuel also needs Eli. How many more times do you think Samuel would have popped up out of bed and run around saying, here I am, what do you need to strangers that he came upon if Eli had not pointed out that it was God speaking? Our God is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the God of all generations, ancient and new. And it is only together, the old and the young, that we make the body of Christ. So this passage is a lesson for us in the intergenerational body of the church, a lesson in working together, in sharing gifts, in lifting each other up, in sharing and receiving wisdom. And this passage is a word of hope. Because we see right out the gate, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. 
boy, is that depressing. The word of the Lord is rare. It makes, makes me wonder, what voices were people listening to? Were they just not listening at all? Maybe they were searching, wondering, desperate for a word of hope, desperate for direction or some sort of sign. Perhaps you know what it is like to be searching for direction or meaning. Perhaps you are seeking and searching and it feels like the, the word of the Lord is rare in these days. But what the story of Samuel reminds us is that the voice still calls, even when the word feels rare. God is still speaking. God is still reaching out to us, even when it feels rare. God's call comes when we least expect it, and often to those we least expect. Often at times when we feel the least worthy. So let's be like Hannah, nurturing others, setting them up to experience God, bringing them to church or being the church for them. Let us be like Eli, encouraging others to grow in their faith, sharing experiences and wisdom. And let us be like Samuel, ready to serve, willing to learn always, always listening, always being tuned in to what the Spirit of God is doing in the world, in the body of Christ, and within each one of us. And always give thanks to God. Hear these words of blessing. You are called. Do you hear it? You are called to encourage. Are you willing? May the Spirit of God call you and work through you in all that you do. Go in peace from this time together. Amen.